Hi, folks. Welcome to the future of democracy. Uh, my name is Sam Gill. And in this show, what we try to do is take a look at some of the big ideas, big trends, big controversies that are really animating uh, our democracy, our national conversation, and take you a little deeper than you might be able to get just hearing a debate on cable news or reading one article. And this month, we are teaming up with the Miami Book Fair to host an amazing set of conversations with authors, with artists, focused on different topics about what they think about the future of democracy. And this is all leading up to the 37th annual Miami Book Fair from November 15 to 22nd. The Book Fair is an incredible collection of authors, an incredible collection of books, a really vital conversation about ideas. If you're interested, please go to miamibookfaironline.com uh, or follow them at, at Miami Book Fair. If you're not interested, then you're not paying attention to the incredible authors they're going to have. This year, Natalie Portman, uh, the actress, is going to be a part of the Miami Book Fair. Bill Nye, the science guy, is going to be part of the Miami Book Fair. And you can hear every single presentation, every single talk for free, but only if you tune in from November 15 to 22. So of the authors that we had a chance to sit down with, one of them is the inimitable P.J. O'Rourke. P.J. O'Rourke is a famously caustic a uh, satirist, a uh, caustic observer of the American political scene. He's a multiple New York Times uh, best-selling author. Uh, he's also a frequent panelist on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. And we had the chance to sit down and talk about his new book, A Cry from the Far Middle, Dispatches from a Divided Land. I hope you enjoy the conversation. All right, PJ, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so, for having me. So the book is called A Cry from the Far Middle. Where is the far middle and what does it want? Well, where it is is a very lonely place. <laughs> and, uh, I feel like I'm standing out on the uh, double yellow line on some, some lonely highway with uh, idiots passing me on the left at 140 miles an hour and more idiots and great big pickup trucks flying Confederate flags, throwing up gravel on the right. And, and uh, I'm just feeling all sort of sorry for myself out here. But the truth of the matter is I think that the great majority of Americans are in the middle. I don't mean that we should agree about everything. I mean, we're in the middle to the extent that uh, we know that there are a lot of like really important political issues, big, expensive, uh, difficult, complex political issues, and they need to be argued out, but they need to be argued in the, in the proper sense of the word, not, not screamed and shouted out. Um, uh, not, 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 not burned and busted and looted out, you know, not intimidated and shot out. Um, this needs to be an argument. So one of the things that really struck me in the book, and, and for those who are listening, we're recording this, you know, 48 hours after the, less fewer than 48 hours after the first presidential, you know, debate in quotation marks, for those of you listening on the podcast version. And I was, when I, when I read the book before the debate, there are two chapters at, toward the end that I would consider a positive vision of politics. You give a version of an inaugural address that you would give and a kind of idealized political debate. And it's, as a reader, the linchpin to me for both of those was an idea of humility and civility, just to what you said. It wasn't about agreement, but there was a notion of humility about the need to solve problems together and civility in making that happen. After that presidential debate, it's hard to feel like we're even in the same solar system of that ideal. Yeah, well, it wouldn't be an inaugural uh, address that I would make because I'm not going there. I mean, one of the problems I think we have with politics in the United States is that what sane person any longer wants to run for office. But yeah, humility was the keynote um, um, that, 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 that I would have my ideal liberal and my ideal conservative and my ideal either one of them that got elected is to say that, look, you know, the president is, uh, uh, you own this company, you the citizens own this company. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sort of the janitor, you know, I don't even make the laws, the Congress makes the laws. I don't decide whether the laws are, 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 you know, fit with our constitution or not. The courts decide that. 
um, I'm supposed to execute the laws, but, uh, uh, but, but, you know, it's not like they gave me a bunch of executioner weapons to do it with. I, I'm, I, I'm really the school janitor here. And not everything that happens on my shift is, uh, was caused by me. Uh, so if you think that I'm responsible for all the good things in your life, that's not true. And, you know, on the flip side of that, it's not true that everything bad that happens uh, on my shift is, 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 is exactly my fault. It's gonna, I'm going to have to take uh, responsibility for it because you elected me. But you got to understand the world is much more complex. And this is a very free country. And I don't have that much control over your life. I'm not supposed to have that much control over your life. Um, but let's get back to... <laughs> the debate <laughs> and if ever there were a use for air quotes yeah, exactly. it would be over the debate i have seen more substantive arguments take place on barroom floors conducted <laughs> with fists and boots and i will say this i've never seen one of those that lasted 90 minutes so <laughs> it was just a, just an awful thing and um uh, I, I mean, the, the president's behavior was 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 bad. Uh, I mean, it, it, was, it was just it, it, incredibly rude, dismissive, noisy. Um, I guess we sort of expected that from him. But it was also in a weird sort of way self-defeating. Um, I'm no fan of the president, but I'm no huge fan of Joe Biden either. And if, if the president had just shut up and let Biden ramble on, uh, Biden has the capacity to drone and sort of like lose the plot and, you know, say, uh, 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 we were talking before we went on about how glad we were we weren't playing the uh, here's the deal drinking game <laughs> with, uh, uh, with Joe Biden. And uh, that Trump would have had a much stronger performance keeping his mouth shut uh, 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 and, and, and letting Joe, giving Joe some rope. Um, I, so, you know, I truly don't understand. And of course, I, and instead what he did every time Joe was wandering off into some like, into some policy maze, Trump would say something horrible about his kid and, yeah. uh, and inject adrenaline into, uh, in, into Joe's performance, you know, perk him right up, you know, snap him back into focus. So what, but what do you, in, in the context of, the malady that the that the book really really explores um, in 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 American politics and American political culture, like what what's the antidote? Like it's as as you're saying, you know, let's say it had been the most civil debate ever, it still would have been a debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. Like it's not right. it would not have promised right. the kind of inspiration, the kind of pragmatism, the kind of cosmic humility that it seems to me you feel has really become missing? Do we just, do we need different candidates or do we need a different system? Well, uh, you know, we, it, it's very hard to change our, our system, but, but uh, at, at a sort of macro level, but at a micro level, yes, we probably do need a new system, which would entail each of us getting involved. I mean, one of the reasons we have the lousy candidates that we have, and I speak for both parties over a long period of time, um, is that, um, our, 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 our political parties really don't have much, much power at a, at a national level. I mean, the Republican National Committee, Democratic National Committee are really dependent on everything for f on 50 state uh, 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 party committees. And those 50 state power committees, uh, uh, party committees don't really have that much power either because they're dependent on the county level um, and none of us get involved at county level. I mean, who among us can name our county Republican chairman, our county Democratic chairman? I sure couldn't. You know, I mean, there's a 5,000 in some counties in the United States. And what happens is that the re Republican county uh, uh, committee ends up being run by some retired aluminum siding salesman whose plaid polyester plant pants don't match his plaid polyester shirt. And the Democratic uh, County Committee ends up running by, being run by an embittered divorce woman with 40 cats. And that's who's running the country, you know? So that we as individual citizens 
um, have to get our get uh, down in there and involved. And of course, what we really need to look for is not candidates who want to run. Wanting to be president of the United States is probably an indication of mental illness on the face of it. You know, if you open the uh, the, the psychiatrist desk reference and uh, check narcissistic personality disorder, I think there are like nine indicators of narcissistic personality disorders. And uh, the average politician ticks off 11 of those nine uh, <laughs> indications of narcissistic personality disorder. We need to draft people. I would have loved to have seen Colin Powell uh, um, um, as president. I know he didn't want to go, but he was in the military. He understands about the draft. You know, we should have simply just drafted him. So that's one thing. And then, of course, as journalists, we, we, we are not without blame either because our attention tends to be turned not to the dull and worthy candidates, of which there were a plethora uh, 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 last time around, um, but you know, if it bleeds, it leads, uh, or in, uh, uh, in less, less violent circumstances, if it slees, it leads. And we pay far much too, too much attention to the crazy people. I mean, Donald Trump and, and, and Bernie Sanders got an amount of attention in this previous election and, uh, and this, you know, than, than, than either of them deserve. Um, sometimes I got to say in the case of like Hillary Clinton, a candidate is so dull that I, as a journalist, I despair of making this interesting, but, uh, uh, but that's my problem. That's something I have to solve. So one of the things that was interesting early in the book, um, you, you have, uh, have this line, what this country needs is fewer people who know what this country needs. And, I'm sort of thinking about this in the context of um, of the current you know crisis, COVID crisis that we're living through, which you know on the one hand, you know certainly is is not helped by the sort of dueling performances of 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 I'm here to help uh, without real practical solutions. On the other hand, you know part of the crisis has been that it's unclear who to turn to. It's unclear who actually is going to exercise some real leadership. Um, in helping us to in helping us to identify what's safe and healthy, uh, and helping to ensure some kind of uniformity in our response. How do you how is the how is the COVID crisis um, influenced um, your view uh, about about the management side of leadership about what constitutes effective leadership? Well, it does bring back into focus that question of leadership, and it's almost you almost get the feeling that being led in the wrong direction um, uh, might, might have been like better for the nation than not being led at all. Yeah. Uh, generally speaking, it, I mean, it's a, it's a paradox of our system. Generally speaking, our federalist system with its devolved and, 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 and decentralized forms of authority where really uh, most of our interactions are with local and state government um, the federal government has only, you know, despite having expanded enormously, it still has only a secondary role in day-to-day -day life. It's not the federal government that delivers. It is the federal government that delivers our mail, but they don't pick up our garbage and think about which is more important. I could go without mail for a couple of weeks. I can't go without garbage pickup for a couple of weeks. That would be the, the town. Um, Anyway, normally this works well. It allows people to experiment with things like California can go crazy and the other states can look at that and say the other 49 can go, well, let's not go there. <laughs> you know? and, or, you know, Massachusetts can cut its tax rates and, 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 and rein in its regulatory um, uh, 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 apparatus as it, as it did. And we can look at that and say, well, you know, Massachusetts is, is, is doing very well economically and Massachusetts is booming. Maybe we should take a, a, a lesson from that and so on. But then when it comes to a kind of natural national crisis, especially when it's a, in an internal national crisis, we're pretty good at uniting as a country when there's an external threat. But with an internal threat, we are really left with nobody in charge. And it would have taken um, uh, 
uh, the President of the United States doesn't have infinite power in, in, in this respect, but he has tremendous influence. And the fact that we were already getting, to a certain extent, getting mixed messages from the most expert people uh, uh, that we were able to contact, then we start to get, you know, drink bleach um, um, from the president. I know, as he said, I said that sarcastically. <laughs> well, how else would you say it? <laughs> you know, but, um, you know, when we, when we get uh, a, a complete confusion at the top like that, it does, it does show the, the weakness of, of, of this federalist system. I don't think we should give up on it, but it does show how important it is to have a, a, a really a responsible, um, um, a predictable um, um, person who's willing to listen, person who's willing to learn uh, in the White House. I mean, it does, it strikes me too. I mean, if you've got, particularly in a crisis, if you've got some broad guidance from the top, our federalism can certainly be a strength. You know, having a local public health authority can be an enormous strength uh, in helping a community to distill high level advice and guidance into practice that's going to work for that community. It strikes me though that like one of the challenges it seems we're confronting is that the kind of people that you're speaking to and about in the book, people who are just so exasperated with the state of national politics, that, that that culture of national politics, what we saw on the debate stage, has also colored our perceptions of whether to trust the, lo you know, the local fire authority when there are wildfires or, or not trust them, and whether to trust or not trust the local public health authority. Like, to what extent is, is, has, the, has the malady become something that's led us to go south on the system at all levels, even where it, that system is still really working on our behalf? Well, you basically, in your question, you've said my answer. Um, the, uh, I'm not a professional uh, yeah, interviewer. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is uh, 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 this forest fire is a hoax. You know, it, uh, 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 you know, they, people saying that right until their house catches on fire, and then they blame it on George Soros. You know, I mean, it's yeah, yes, it has infected the the the, the bad political atmosphere has ha, has infected our everyday life. And of course, we're the carriers of that infection. I mean, one of the things I talk about in the book is, is, is you know, the, the, uh, the internet. And uh, uh, I mean, whose bright idea was it to put every idiot in the world in touch with every other idiot? You know, no matter how wrong you are about an issue, you know, with a couple of clicks of your fingers, you can find a large enthusiastic group of people who are even wronger about that issue than you are and join them, you know. It's, uh, it turns out, I mean, of course, uh, the, the First Amendment uh, uh, ensures that we all have our, uh, you know, our, our freedom to speak and to speak our views. But, you know, the pure physicality of that used to put a certain filter on it. I mean, if you had nutty views, you had to get a mimeograph machine and turn out a bunch of pamphlets and stand on a street corner and hand out those pamphlets and carry a sign and chant the, you know, the, the world is ending. And um, uh, uh, it, it, that was good. That was a good thing. Now that you can do this, you know, instantly, you know, in your underpants, you know, from, from anywhere. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's, uh, it, it, I think it's kind of overwhelmed us. I think this is something that we'll get over, but it may not be in my lifetime, you know, I mean, it, it may take, it may take, it may take decades. Um, uh, it is important to remember that when newspapers, when, when popular newspapers, uh, dailies and weeklies and small towns, were first became practical because of the lowering costs of, 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 of transportation, printing presses, and, 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 and paper, and so on, um, that most of those newspapers were ridiculously, ridiculously partisan, screaming and yelling partisan. And they, they, they were as nonsensical as anything that's on the internet today. It wasn't until they grew into a mature industry and they had like certain sort of boundaries that they began yeah. to feel. And also the, the uh, capitalism in one of its like good moments um, kind of ensured that these newspapers and then radio stations and television stations would want to reach out to everybody. 
because the advertisers demanded it. If you got a furniture store, you're going, I don't want to sell sofas just to Democrats. I don't want to sell sofas just to Republicans. I want to sell sofas to everybody, you know? And so that put a certain sort of, of, of useful constraint on media that, that, that you know, our personal media interfaces do not have that restraint. I think that will gradually develop, you know, it's, it's almost like we found a new food and we don't know what utensil to use with it. And we're smearing it all over our face and eventually we'll figure out that should probably go in a spoon or maybe needs to be cut up with a knife and fork. Um, uh, right. but, but, but this could take a long time. Right. Unfortunately, it has the unfortunate quality of already connecting all of us in incredibly profound ways as we try to figure out, as we try to figure out quite how to digest it. Um, so one other, another development that, that happened around the time you were publishing the book has been um, the protests that have ensued more or less without cessation since the murder of George Floyd. And I wanted to ask you a couple questions about this. The first is, as someone who I who I would certainly regard as having a very healthy kind of uh, skepticism of government and central authority in your writing, um, how have you responded to a central feature of these debates, which is either the either skepticism and criticism of, or in some cases, the outright rejection of institutional policing as it's currently practiced? This isn't something you were able to get into in the book, and I'm no. curious how you've reacted in the months since. Well, you know, having been on the other side of the, uh, of the uh, uh, metaphorically speaking, on the other side of the Portland occupied zone um, fence in my youth, um, I, I would, well, first I, I begin by saying, um, you, you, you kind of got to watch it with your protests, especially with the, um, um, you know, how, how destructive they get, how, how, how abrasive they get, because um, I think my friends and I in the anti-war movement probably prolonged the Vietnam War mm. with our antics, dressing up in clown clothes, you know, to, 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 to spread peace and love and understanding by breaking windows and so on. Um, I, I may have personally prolonged the, 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 the Vietnam War by five minutes, you know, with my behavior. I, I, I don't know. But I do know that we got Nixon elected quite handily and reelected by a landslide um, uh, and having, uh, you know, our antics being uh, a part of that. So be careful. I mean, this is, a, as I pointed out, as we all know, this is a free country. There are a tremendous number of ways to show that you think the country is on the wrong track. There are plenty of ways to make your views seen. Um, everything I think um, that's going on, uh, and, and it's not baseless. Uh, I mean, do the police, uh, do, are the police too militarized? Are, do the police act like an occupying force in too many neighborhoods? Um, do they get out of hand? Do they get panicky? And uh, and grossly over relaxed, uh, overreact. Uh, are they as well trained as as they should be? Um, uh, all these are, are valid questions. But everything should be measured against the standards, really, of Martin Luther King's March on Washington. Um, that that kind of of the dignity, um, uh, the beauty of the rhetoric. Um, the, um, uh, the, the, the self-discipline of, 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 of the crowd, um, it was persuasive. Uh, uh, let us not forget that, that, that Martin Luther King led the largest protest movement in the history of the United States that succeeded, May possibly the only protest movement in the history of the United States that succeeded. And uh, one of the reasons was the enormous dignity, the calm, and the, uh, uh, and the quiet good reasoning that he and, 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 and many, many people in the, in, in the civil rights movement brought to that, to that movement. That's the way it should be done. What, um, what words of hope would you give to 
to the far middle in this in this moment and and it's okay to start with here's the deal if you want he's got that little hand movement that goes exactly. here's the deal <laughs> is um uh, now this country's got a lot of keel this country's got a lot of keel we can take water from the right we can take water from the left we tend to right ourselves and sail on. Uh, uh, now, there have been exceptions to that, but we got through even the worst exceptions. Um, and, um, you know, people say, oh, America has never been as divided as it is now. And I, and I think back, you know, as somebody who not only experienced the 60s, but in my own small pers personal way caused some of it, <laughs> we were much more divided then. It was a really angry and divided country. The, the kind of riots that were going on in our inner cities at that time, we, we've seen nothing like that, thank God. And the heck with the 1960s. What about the 1860s? I mean, 1861, now that was divided, you know. However, sorry we may be feeling for ourselves at the moment. Fort Sumter is not taking any incoming, so... Well, this has been tremendous. The, 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 this conversation will be uh, broadcast and extended as part of the 37th annual Miami Book Fair, which runs from November 15 to 22nd. All readings, presentations, and conversations at the Book Fair will be free, but only available during that week, November 15 to 22nd. In addition to PG O'Rourke, other voices include Walter Mosley, Bill Nye, the Science Guy, and Abby Wambuck. You can visit MiamiBookFairOnline.com or at Miami Book Fair on Twitter. And the Future of Democracy from Knight Foundation airs live Thursdays at 1 p.m. Every episode is available at kf.org slash fdshow or on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you follow your podcast. We will also drop every single one of these special Miami Book Fair episodes there. The author is PJ O'Rourke. The book is A Cry from the Far Middle, Dispatches from a Divided Land. You can find him at pjoRourke.com. PJ, thank you so much for joining us. Sam, you're very welcome, and, and thank you for, for giving me a, a – for not – for non-no-platforming non, non, me. <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs>